Hey there, everybody. My name is Bart Balsens, and in this first chapter, we're going to talk about business information systems, strategy, and governance. As the title suggests, the chapter is subdivided into three parts, business information systems, strategy, and governance. So let's zoom into business information systems first. Here you can see the overview of this first part. We're going to talk about the motivation of the usage of business information systems as strategic enablers of an organization first. Then we're going to define business information systems and look at its various components. To conclude this first part, we're going to talk about different types of business information systems. So let's get started. Why do we need information technology? Well, information technology is all around these days. You use your computer to log on to your student account, to check your email, to download the course slides, and so on. Also, businesses use IT technology on a very intensive basis to support all their types of business activities, such as marketing, human resources, operations, and logistics, etc. Businesses are under continuous pressure of digital disruption. Why? Because we continuously see new IT developments, new types of IT technology, which offer very uh, interesting um, opportunities for businesses. Think about, think about smartphones, for example, think about smart sensors, for example, but also think about newer developments, such as drones, think about self-driving cars, and so on. These are what we often refer to as digital disruptors because they disrupt the way that businesses are conducting their business nowadays and offer all kinds of new strategic opportunities to create added value. Companies simply can't afford to work in the same old ways. Under competitive pressure, they have to be continuously on the lookout for these new technologies and see whether they can successfully use them or embed them in their current organizational units. Technologies and processes are becoming only more sophisticated. Think about e-business, for example. When e-business came, came up, many uh, existing businesses had to migrate their bricks and mortar companies to become companies that are present in the online world. They had to start developing websites. They had to start thinking about ways to sell their products online. And obviously, new challenges came up about how we should do this. Like, how can we sell our products online? How can we ship them to the customer in a cost-effective way? And in case it turned out that there were errors during this process, accompanying processes had to be supported in terms of reverse logistics, like sending damaged goods or orders back to the company and so on. So it, the emergence of e-business, for example, meant a complete re-engineering for existing business models. Even nowadays, many businesses still have to migrate their existing old business models to the internet to uh, enable an online presence. Information technology must join business to think systematically about how to face in new digital technologies. That's a very important bullet because it says, if you look at many businesses nowadays, you have two types of people. You have the IT people and they know everything about hardware and software and new developments in there. And you have the business people. You have marketing people, you have human resources people, operational logistics people who know the very essence of the business they are working in. And oftentimes you see like a communication gap between both types of people, between the pure IT people and the business people. And what's really important in order to gain competitive advantage and as such to generate shareholder value is that both um, IT people and business people get into close contact such that the IT people know the challenges that the business people are being exposed to and vice versa. The business people are aware of new emerging technologies that could better support their businesses. That's what we often refer to as business IT alignment. And that will be also one of the key messages to convey during this first, sec during this first lesson. Business and IT should be aligned. They should not work as separate silos in an organization. They should not be separated. There should not be a Chinese wall between IT on the one hand and business on the other hand. They should closely interact. 
because only by cross-fertilizing and closely interacting, they will be able to generate business value and shareholder value. Business value may be a bit of a vague term at this moment, but when I say business value, I'm basically referring to generating profit, reducing costs, or improving shareholder value, right? So it's really important uh, that business and IT get together, closely collaborate, so as to gain competitive advantage. Let's give you some examples of how emerging IT technologies have dramatically changed the way businesses conduct their activities. Analytics is one of them. Um, I do a lot of research in analytics myself. I'm a, a professor of big data and analytics here at KU Leuven. Uh, look at Amazon, for example. Um, Amazon is an online um, website. You all know Amazon. Yeah, they sell books, they sell music, they sell games, and so on. Analytics is used by Amazon in their recommender systems. So as soon as you log on to Amazon and you have purchased some products, then Amazon will make a profile of you using analytics, using this innovative IT technology, which we refer to as analytics. This profile is continuously updated based upon the, purchase, the purchases you make and also based upon uh, what web pages you visit on the Amazon website, such that Amazon carefully knows what you're interested in. Based upon this, Amazon will make well-targeted recommendations. For example, they will say, Bart, he's interested in analytics, he's interested in stories or books about World War I, World War II, etc. So based on that, they will make a profile for me and come up with very targeted recommendations once a new book on data science or analytics comes out or a new book on World War I or World War II comes out, etc. They will make that targeted recommendation for me. Netflix, same story. I guess we all use Netflix quite often. And what Netflix is doing is actually they're using analytics to understand the profile of the movies you're interested in, right? What movies or documentaries or TV shows you're interested in. It's actually so important for Netflix that a few years ago, they made some of their data, obviously anonymized, publicly available. So Netflix look, looked at some of their viewer data, made that publicly um, um, available and launched what we refer to as the Netflix price. That meant that investigators, researchers worldwide could investigate that data and come up with a recommender system which had to beat the current recommender system Netflix was using at that very moment in time with at least 10% in performance. If a team of researchers was capable to do that, they earned $1 million. And actually, there was um, a team of researchers from AT&T, uh, the well-known American uh, telco provider, that managed to beat uh, the, the system, the recommendation system Netflix was using at that very moment, and they won the Netflix $1 million prize. So just to illustrate how important IT can become in order to develop new types of business models. Let's give some further examples. Internet of Things. Internet of Things is that the purpose of the Internet of Things is to equip various types of um, products, various types of things with Internet attached sensors, which continuously transmit data, which can then be subsequently analyzed for particular types of purposes. Let's give the example of telematics. Telematics is an IoT, so Internet of Things based technology, which is commonly used by many insurance providers worldwide. It means that you're gonna install a black box in your car or just an app on your iPhone, which is gonna continuously monitor your driving behavior. How do you accelerate? Do you accelerate in an aggressive way or not so aggressively? What are your cornering skills? What are your parking skills? How fast do you drive on average? So all of this allows the insurance provider to make a profile, out of, a profile out of your driving behavior that directly relates to your riskiness. That riskiness will then be used to determine your insurance uh, price, the price of your car insurance, for example. So telematics is another way uh, of how emerging IT technology can disrupt existing business models, but also 
offer new business opportunities. It allows us to come up with a driver profile based on the driving behavior of the chauffeur and then um, connect that to your insurance profile and as such, uh, better calculate the insurance price. Mucol is another interesting firm. Uh, Mucol is an Irish firm and you know, like Ireland is very important for its farming industry, right? So they export a lot of farming products. Um, and Mucol, what they did is they developed IOT, Internet of Things sensors for cows, for pregnant cows. Because as it turned out that if you have a pregnant cow, and it's about to give birth, it starts making movements with its tail, specific type of movements. So if you can see those movements, right, you know that the cow is about to give birth. But imagine that you're a farmer and you have thousands of cows, a herd of thousands of cows. What Mukol did was they developed Internet of Things sensors, which they attached to the tail of a cow and which transmits to a central IT system, to a server, data about the movement of the tail. This central computer for thousands of cows can then monitor which cows, which pregnant cows are about to give birth. When a signal, an incoming signal states that there's a particular cow located somewhere and the sensor also gives location data, that a particular cow is about to give birth, immediately information is being sent to the veterinary such that he or she can come to the place and help the cow give birth. So that's how Internet of Things can seriously disrupt existing business models and offer again new business opportunities, as I mentioned before. Drones, well, we all use drones. Some of you, well, we don't all use drones, but some of you use drones for leisure purposes, right? For taking picture, aerial pictures, etc. But they also offer new business opportunities. For example, in insurance, what could you do as an insurance provider with drones? So let me tell you one project that um, we are about to get working on is the following. Imagine that there's a very intensive storm, right? A storm, a huge storm with a lot of storm damage. Now, if I have a house and my house get damaged by the storm, I can file an insurance claim afterwards to have my house repaired and get that money back from my insurance provider. Now, let's assume that I would be a malicious type of person. I would be a fraudster. So there is a storm and my house remains intact, but I would like to have a new roof. When I'm a malicious type of guy, which I'm obviously not, right? Uh, but if I would be a malicious type of guy, then what I could do is I can deliberately inflict damage to my roof. And then afterwards, I file an insurance claim and I say it was because of the storm, so I need a new roof. This is a type of insurance fraud which has been quite commonly observed with insurance providers. So how can we deal about that as an insurance provider? Well, what insurance providers are thinking of nowadays, and this is pretty emerging um, technology, is once a storm has taken place, they send out drones. The drones take pictures of the state of the houses in particular neighborhoods, right? And they store that in a centralized database. Once an insurance claim comes in for somebody whose property got damaged, whose house got damaged, the picture of the damage that is part of the insurance claim can be contrasted with the picture taken by the drone. And we can all do that in a very automated way using a technology which I'm not going to elaborate on right now, but we're using a technology which is called deep learning which allows you to learn really deep, complex patterns from unstructured data, such as imagery, uh, voice, uh, audio files, etc. And then you can contrast both. And when there's a difference between the picture taken right after the storm and the picture, which is part of the insurance claim, then you know it's likely a fraudulent claim. Drones can also be used for forest maintenance. Like um, I know an Irish firm, for example, I forgot the name, but they use drones to continuously monitor which trees are about to die and to see where they have to cut what trees. Drones are also being used by Amazon or they're not using them frequently yet, right? So it's not common practice, but Amazon is contemplating the usage of drones for package delivery, right? Think about self-driving cars. Think about self-driving cars and the impact self-driving cars will have on the taxi industry, for example. So you see, these are all examples of how IT 
disrupts existing business models, but also in creates new opportunities. Unfortunately, this also comes with a danger. Deepfake, for example. Deepfake is a technology. Um, I'm, I'm going to explain it in a, in a bit of a superficial way such that you just get the idea. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details here. But Deepfake is an artificial intelligence, AI based technology, which, which allows you to learn from images. So if I would have to learn from images, video or audio. So imagine that you're all students and I record your audio a few times. Right. So I, let, I record your voice a few times. Then I can use an artificial intelligence system that starts to learn your voice. And once this artificial intelligence system, this deep fake model has learned your voice, I can use that model. It's no longer you. It's a model. It's a set of mathematical formulas. I can use that model, those mathematical formulas to make you say anything. Obviously, it's not you saying it. It's the model saying it, but it will sound to your friends, to your colleagues, like you saying it. There's been some very funny examples of that, for example, where uh, one example I still remember is that um, an artificial intelligence or a deep fake system learned the movements of Adolf Hitler as he was making his speeches. And then it used those movements and projected them onto Obama making a speech. So it's pretty funny when you see Obama making a speech, which is not as violent as the one that Adolf Hitler used to make, but you could see Obama making a speech, a peaceful speech, but using the gesture and the movements of Adolf Hitler because they kind of merged both patterns that they learned. Now, deepfake is a technology that you can use um, in a beneficial way, right? Think about chatbots. A chatbot is an application. If you if you if you call a customer service desk, there's a chatbox, a chatbot that answers your queries, your questions. You can use deepfake to automate that, right? So if you have somebody with a warm, comfortable voice, then you can learn that voice and use that, implement that in your chatbot, uh, such that if a customer calls your customer service desk, that the person answering is not a person, it's a system, it's a model, it's an IT system, it's a deepfake system, ha also has that warm, healthy voice. But you can also have, again, malicious uses of deepfake. For example, in 2019, it was, the CEO of a UK-based energy firm believed that he was called by his superior from its German parent company. But in fact, the voice was that from a cyber criminal who used deep fake technology, voice technology, to spoof, to imitate the German executive so as to convince his UK colleague to immediately transfer about $200,000 to, a, to an, a Hungarian bank account. In 2019, 21, for example, several senior European members of Parliament were approached by individuals who used deep fake technology to imitate Russian opposition uh, figures during video calls. So there's also dangers that come to it. And we should be on the continuous lookout for that. Why do we need IT? I guess you're already convinced right now, at least I hope you are, but we need business leaders with great IT capabilities in our age of digital automation and artificial intelligence, especially the latter has become very important nowadays. Artificial intelligence is everywhere, right? Um, the behavior of you as a student, for example, even today at this very day you're watching this lecture is continuously being analyzed using artificial intelligence models. If you call somebody, um, your telco provider will, for example, know who you called, during what time period, etc. If you make a credit card transaction, your bank or your credit card provider will know that you made a card transaction and will know whether it might be fraudulent, yes or no. Very important thing here, and I already referred to it, is the alignment between business and IT, right? Um, I guess many of you who will graduate, some of you will end up in IT, I think a minority, but most of you will end up uh, in business uh units such as marketing finance human resources operational logistics etc and it's very important if you end up in those areas that you are on the continuous lookout as i mentioned before for new it technology and see how you can leverage that in your um, business operations so business it alignment the connection the strong communication between business and it is really key here in order to create competitive advantage Organizations, as I said, should move from siloed business units, so business units which are strongly separated 
with almost Chinese walls in between and departments to all encompassing digital organizations. In other words, IT is everywhere, right? Everyone needs to be involved with IT and speak the IT language. It, it's really important because IT is at the cornerstone of um, being at the forefront in uh, business nowadays. In this course, we're going to elaborate further on that, and we're going to start from the fundamentals, obviously, and then gradually build up. This is a basic course, so we're not going to go into the nitty gritty details of data modeling, of process modeling, of rule modeling, knowledge modeling, and so on. This is more for other courses, but this course is a little bit, um, gives you an overview into various um, uh, business IT related topics, which we believe are fundamental to you guys as business engineer students or economic students or applied economic students uh, before um, entering into the real world of business. This course will provide you with a starting point to, I'm not going to read everything to understand the necess necessity of business IT alignment. I guess you already get that by now, right? And how IT can create competitive advantage. You will be able to understand the fundamentals of enterprise architecture. You will be able to understand and explain business process models. So the various steps to conduct particular type of activity with a specific type of goal. You'll be able to understand and develop information models for the design of databases. We will talk about SQL, right? Structured Query Language, uh, which is a, a language which is really important these days in, a, in any type of business, which allows you to extract information from a database tailored to your needs, right? To your specific needs. You will be able to understand the importance and key concepts of business intelligence and analytics. We will, under, we will zoom into how big data analytics will change the business or is changing the business landscape and how some basic data analytics techniques work. So we're not going to zoom into advanced ways of doing analytics. This is part of more advanced courses. And then obviously we're going to zoom into the web, the internet, web technologies. Uh, we're going to uh, elaborate on how the web can be leveraged um, to conduct business. We're going to talk about web analytics and so on. So a very exciting course, if you ask me. Um, this course is actually uh, lays the groundwork for other courses that you may want to follow. The top course is a very interesting course, especially since I teach it myself. It's your principles of database management, where we're going to zoom into uh, database technology, how to model data, how to query data, how to deal with big data, etc. But there's also other related courses like business analysis, uh, by my colleague, Professor Duert, Architecture and Modeling of MIS, Management Information Systems by Professor Snook, Knowledge Management and Business Intelligence, which I will also partly teach and which we're going to zoom into more of the business analytics stuff, Business Process Management, ICT Service Management and Requirements Engineering, which is also taught by Professor Snook. So you see this, this course is a bit central and um, the concepts and the methods that you will learn in this course will, will be built further upon in the various surrounding courses that you see outlined here. Good. So let's talk about business information systems. And the first uh, thing that we have to talk about is what is information, right? So you see that information plays a, a central role in any type of business information system. So we'll talk about information first, then zoom into what is a system, and then talk about business information systems. Well, to understand what information is, we first need to understand what data is, then we're going to, from there onwards, move on to defining information, and from there onwards, we're going to look at what knowledge actually is. Data is a raw observed fact, fact of an event, like a business transaction. So suppose you go to a supermarket, you buy certain types of items, you buy frozen pizza, you buy beer, um, uh, you buy Coca-Cola, etc. These are raw observed facts, like bought Coca-Cola, the number of units that you bought of Coca-Cola, the price you paid, uh, the payment method, and so on. And data is usually represented using symbols, using numbers, using, um, using texture in textual format, using documents, etc. So data is actually a raw product. Right? Based on data, you can derive information. Information is processed data, useful for a decision-making process, right? That processing is usually uh, takes place in a particular type of context, right? So it will provide answers to 
who provided the data, what we can do with the data, where the data was gathered, when the data was gathered. So all these type of questions are very important. So information, you could refer to information as like interpreted data. You add interpretation to the data. Right? And obviously, as mentioned, data is the building block of information. Knowledge takes it one step further. Knowledge is kind of enriched information. It's, it kind of represents the ability to perform certain tasks by combining data with own information and experience. So by combining data, each time, maybe also with some extra information on top, you can get knowledge. This sounds very abstract at this very moment, right? So let's just, let's just provide a, an example to give you some further clarification. So here you can see data, right? These are marks on certain types of courses. So you have business information course, business information systems course, it's a first column, then principles of database management course, remember a very exciting course. Um, analytics, also exciting. Architecture and modeling of information systems, another interesting course. In the rows, you get the students. So you get Bart, Monique, Jochen, Eva, Bob, and Anne, and they have marks on these um, courses. Now, this is data. The marks are data. So Bart has a mark of 14 on the business information systems course, which is good, but obviously not excellent. Um, this is a data, a data element, right? It actually, it's really hard to interpret this data because if I would give this data, to somebody who does not know the context, he or she will not know how to interpret it. Is 14 a good mark, yes or no? You don't know, because you don't know what the maximum mark is. We obviously all know that the maximum mark is 20, but if you don't know what the maximum mark is, you don't know what the minimum mark is, you don't know how to interpret this data. Data is just a raw source, right? It's really raw and it will be stored into your computer using uh, bits and bytes, right? But now what we can do is we can provide interpretation to the data so as to make it information. And that is in my next slide. My next slide, basically we had, we added the blue column. Um, so um, the blue column, because what it basically says is whether a student passed for a course, yes or no, that's information. So what we now do is we compare the mark against a, a cutoff, a threshold of 10. So we already know that the minimum is zero, the maximum is 20. That is the context. And the cutoff is 10. So you see that Bart for business information systems, he has 14. So the pass is yes, right? For principles of database management, rather embarrassingly, he got a, he got a mark of nine. So he failed. So the pass is no. Also for analytics, quite embarrassing once more, he got an, uh, an eight. So the pass is no. And for architecture and modeling of information systems, he again, excelled and he had a mark of 16 pass yes that's information so the blue column gives you information so information is interpretation of data within a particular framework within a particular context and now we can move further to knowledge because have a look at the marks of um, business information systems and in architecture and modeling of information systems look at just those two columns right so you get the column uh, the column right here look at the marks here and look at those columns. So what you can see is, um, I guess most of you took a course in statistics already, you can see that there's a correlation between these two. That's pretty interesting. But you also see, if you look at these marks, that the, they're correlated with the, these marks. So you see that Barn failed principles of database management, and he also failed at analytics. So he's yeah, dealing with data, analyzing data is not what I would call his best quality. So whereas Monique has very good marks on both of these courses. Um, so you see that there's a correlation and that gives us knowledge. So now we see that students with high marks on business information systems usually also have high marks on um, AMIS, architecture and modeling of information systems. That's knowledge. Students who have high marks on principles of database management usually also have high marks on analytics. That's knowledge. So you see data is raw. Information is interpreted data within a particular type of context and knowledge takes it one step further. It starts to combine data and information together to get some more richer insights into uh, the particular problem statement. Another example, this is data 50109. If I say this is data, this is a raw data, but is it information? No, it's not information because we don't know. We know this is 50,109, but 
what does this actually represent? So in order to know what it represents, we have to know the context. And it then it could be the date of the exam, which is the 5th of January 2009. Could be the wage of an employee at K11, 50,109 euros. Could be the zip code of the city Granger, which is stated in the Iowa, United States. Or it could be the zip code of Albertier in Spain. So you can see the same data element can lead up to various types of information. Hence the need for context before you can understand uh, what the data actually means or represents. Metadata is data about data. That sounds a bit uh, confusing at first sight, but it's not really that confusing. Have a Take a look at product number. Every firm typically uh, sells various types of products or services. And to discriminate between those different types of products or services that it sells, it uses a product number. And a product number is used to uniquely identify a product. Right? Identification in a business setting is really very important. You want to uniquely identify employees. You want to uniquely identify your customers. You want to be able to uniquely identify your suppliers, etc., your resources, etc. So product number is a number that allows you to uniquely identify your products. Metadata is data about data. So product number is the data. And now we have data about product number. Product, the, the metadata that comes with product number, for example, could state that product number is always numerical. So you cannot have alphanumerical symbols like letters popping up in product number because product number is assumed to be always numerical and its range is between one and 9,999. So you cannot have a product number of zero or a product number of 10,000 as that's outside the ranges. And there's more metadata like only the product or production department can assign product numbers. So metadata is data about data. It tells you how data is represented, the range of data, and who can decide upon new values of the data, for example. A well-known standard that you've probably seen before in other courses um, is extensible markup language. So you still remember, for example, that if you look at the web, at the internet, that a particular type of internet page, a particular type of website page, is usually represented in HTML, hypertext markup language. So if you go to a particular type of website, you right click your mouse and you do view source, you will see HTML, hypertext markup language. HTML focuses on the representation. So it will tell you whether certain types of uh, information on a website need to be represented in bold, need to be underlined, need to be italics, need to be in a tabular format and, and so on. So it focuses on the representation Whereas XML focuses on the content, not on the representation. It's going to represent the content of data. It's a tag-based language to describe metadata. So it's going to use tags, and users can define their own tags. Maybe sounds a little bit complex, so let's give an example. Here you can see this is part of my wine cellar. I'm a wine lover, so I, I really like wine a lot. Um, so um, I once modeled the entire, uh, my entire wine cellar is part of a MySQL database. Don't worry about MySQL if you're not familiar with that. Uh, but here you can see um, um, a wine database or my wine cellar being represented in terms of XML. So you see, I define my own tags, wine cellar, wine cellar, opening tag, closing tag here, backslash. And then I have wine name. So this is metadata. So this metadata describes that the name of the wine is coming up. Jacques Lost Brut Initial. A very good uh, champagne, if you ask me. This is the year, right? It was made. It's the type. So type, these are tags that specify metadata. So we know that the type is coming up. Here we have the grape and the percentage. So you can see that here, here, the grape, the percentage. So this is a 100% Chardonnay champagne. Really amazing. I have the closing tag. The price, it was a little bit expensive. Um, not all of my wines are like that, by the way, but um, uh, every now and then I have some, some like that. So the price is 150, but 150 is again data, it's meaningless. So we have to provide some context to it. So we say like, look, the currency is Euro, right? Geographical distribution comes from the country, the region, and so on. This is XML. And once you have represented your metadata using XML, you can, 
you can launch all kinds of interesting queries on it like um, uh, it, since it will make data more comprehensible to humans and computers um, I can launch all types of queries like give me all French wines right give me all French wine so I use that metadata element French wine to retrieve now all the French wines um, find all Chardonnay wines so now I'm no longer restricting myself to France but you know we have some excellent Chardonnays being made in Australia as well for example in Chile as well so I can get all Chardonnay wines from there over well um, uh, find, or I can do a little bit more complex type of query like give me all French Chardonnay wines which cost less than 20 euros etc so using that metadata allows you to really ask very particular well tailored types of questions to your um, to your data we're going to come back to that later on just for now try to get the overall picture the overall idea using xml allows us to easily share information between companies and our people this especially applies to e-business for example where you will see that xml is often used between companies to exchange product catalogs supplier information and so on we're going to come back to that later on in the e-business chapter Okay, so now you know what data is, you know what information is, um, you know what knowledge is, but let's now zoom into a system. A system is a set of elements. Right, so you get a set of elements. And the elements are connected or related to each other and possibly to elements from the universe of this course and are joined for a specific purpose. A very heavy definition. So a set of elements, elements are related, possibly to elements from the universe of the scores. The universe of the scores sounds, sounds a bit like Star Wars, but it is not. It is just the ecosystem in which um, a system operates. So if you would look at a business, for example, a particular type of business, let's look at a company, let's look at a bank. A bank operates within a universe of this course. So it has its own system, the bank itself, but it has customers, it has providers, it has regulators which are very important the banking regulator it has the government this is the universe of this course of a bank so it's customers it's um it's uh suppliers the regulator and uh the government and the, all these elements that are part of the bank are joined for a specific type of purpose right for making money for making profit generating shareholder value so a system has elements these could be physical objects like this could be buildings this could be offices, uh, this could be equipment, this could be cars, could be energetic units, could be biological units, just like customers, like employees, etc. And the system also has relations, relations with regard to distance and time, physical relations, logical relations, cause effect relations, and so on. And a system obviously serves one or more purposes, like a bank wants to deliver particular types of banking services, it wants to be able to grant loans it wants to be able to uh, collect money put it on a savings account and then uh, generate some interest for its um, uh, customers or the purpose could be the production of finished goods obtaining profits stimulating employment could also be purposes that are uh, more targeted towards um, environmental concerns for example right towards saving the planet environmental purposes also become very important uh, nowadays we refer often um, to those as sustainability purposes right where you have a firm that contributes to the environment a traffic system could be one particular type we have various elements we have the roads or the road infrastructure we have vehicles we have a person as a driver or a pedestrian or a traffic agent we have legislation that tells you how much you can drive where uh, when you're not allowed to drive etc where you're not allowed to drive uh, lane, lane switching behavior, etc., traffic signs, and so on. There's relations, like there's distances between cities, there's a speed allowed in relation with a specific place, etc. And then there's purposes, optimizing traffic flow, maximizing safety, etc. A description of a system depends upon a purpose. So you have a system, and you can look at a system in various ways, right? Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look at our traffic system. If you're a car driver, you look at the traffic system in a particular way. So you want to drive from Leuven to Paris and you want to look at the uh, closest distance 
or maybe not the closest distance because the closest distance does not necessarily reflect the fastest way of getting from Leuven to Paris. Maybe you want to look at the fastest way to use that, the road infrastructure, to get from Leuven to Paris, depending upon traffic jams, construction works, road works, etc. The police is another user of that system and they're going to monitor the driving behavior and the safety, right? So they're going to look at uh, alcohol, checks, etc. Global positioning system or GPS uh, is another way, is another user of that traffic system, and it will be focused on measuring the shortest distance between any two cities. A cab driver or taxi driver wants to find pickup hotspots. Where does where can we find hotspots to pick up customers? Where a lot of prospects um, are located that could be interested in the taxi service. Taxi service. City council could be looking at the whole traffic system with the aim of facilitating shopping by defining pedestrian only roads. So what's really important, and we're gonna come back to that as we discuss business information systems, there's various angles, there's various ways of looking at a particular type of system. And it depends upon who's looking at it and what is his or her purpose. Here you can see a system, pretty obvious. So we have the input component to the left, right? The input can be anything, right? It could be raw materials it could be data in a business information system later on the input will be data but in a traditional business system it could be raw materials it could even be employees etc you have a process component which is going to do something with the inputs and in order to get an output a system operates in an environment the environment is what we referred to earlier on as the universe of the scores right so system could operate in the environment of where you have the universe of the scores being suppliers, being customers, being the government, being regulators, etc. A system works or processes something to achieve a specific goal. Let's now talk about business information systems having outlined these basic concepts of a system. A business system, before we go into business information systems, so here you can see that information is not in the title, but a business system works with starts with work, labor, materials, finance, funding it receives from the shareholders, from investors or from private equity, data, and then it's gonna feed those into the processes, into production processes, into purchasing processes, into distribution, sales, or information processing systems, and the output will be products, services, or information. This business system oper operates so as to achieve certain types of object objectives, intentions, forecasts. It wants to boost sales. It wants to generate profits. It wants to uh, reduce costs. It wants to contribute to the environment. That could also be a purpose. Um, or it wants to improve shareholder value. And a business system works within a universe of discourse, as I mentioned. So you have the authority, you'll have consumers, you have customers, you have suppliers, you have subcontractors. These are all representing that universe of discourse that I clarified earlier on. So let's now look at business information systems. A business information system is a set of related components, and you should not memorize this definition, right? You should, the exam, I will not ask for those definitions. I will just, um, I will just, uh, it's, the purpose is that you have the general understanding, the general idea. So it's a set of related components to collect, search, process, store, and distribute information in order to support the coordination and control of the decision-making process within an organization. It's even heavy when reading this. But anyway, the idea is a business information system takes data, it's going to process this data, and it's going to do something then with the process data with the information or knowledge that comes out of it. Right? You can see it visualized here. We start from the raw data to the left. First, that raw data needs to be stored using appropriate storage platforms. We discussed this in this very exciting course principles of database management, remember, and then we're going to process it to come up with relevant information or knowledge. You may add knowledge to this final output component box because knowledge is also a very important output. All of this is managed above using information management. And throughout this course, we're going to zoom into various key principles, guidelines, etc., in order to do successful information management. The environment or the universe of the scores or the ecosystem is the company. The information system is a subsystem of your business system. The information system and your business system 
The information system should support your business goals, your business system, and both should be well aligned, should be well integrated. Remember the concept of business IT alignment, which I referred to earlier on, and which you can see um, reiterated here once more. Your business information systems should be used to realize business objectives, to realize profit, shareholder value, sustainability, etc. That's really important. Right? So they should be tightly integrated. They should not be perceived as siloed units, as units which are separate from one another, because then you will not function very well as a business. So it's really important to integrate IT, existing IT technologies, but also emerging IT technologies, as these can indicate interesting opportunities into your business strategy, mission, and goals. Let's now to kind of more or less conclude this first part, zoom into different types of business information systems using this pyramid. So at the bottom of this pyramid, you see the various types of functional areas that a business can be subdivided into. And this is not an exhaustive subdivision, it's just a subdivision into sales and marketing, manufacturing and production, finance and accounting, and then HR human resources. To the left, you have the kind of information system, operational level, that will be short term, we'll come back to that later, management level, midterm, and strategic level or, or executive level. This is what we call, this, this will be more long-term. And here you can see the groups that are served, right? So you have the senior managements, we call them the C-level executives, the middle managers, and then the operational managers right here. We'll zoom into this into a little bit more detail. At the strategic level, we make long-term decisions. If I say long-term, and if I would have to put a time period on it, I would say decisions that have impact even beyond five years from now. At the group level, so at the company group level, it's often based on unstructured information. And we do a lot of what if analyses there. To put it a little bit more uh, concrete at the strategic level, you're going to um, talk about, for example, a merger and acquisition. You're a firm and you're contemplating a merger and acquisition, a merger of another firm, right? So um, a particular type of firm um, is thinking about acquiring another type of firm, an acquisition. That's a strategic decision. A tactical decision is more on the mid-long-term mid decision. It's an, to identify execution plans for group decisions, pro project management, and so on. A tactical decision could be the development of a new type of product, right? or the fine tuning of a particular type of product. So you have a product and you want to kind of add an option to it or, or, or um, um, add a new um, kind of feature to it, that could be a tactical decision. Or uh, coming up with a new type of product is a tactical decision. You're a car manufacturer and you're thinking about adding a new option to one of your existing cars, for example. Operational is the lowest level of decision making. These are daily operations and decisions based on structured information and you get immediate results. An example of this, of a, an operational activity is like you go to a supermarket, you have a market basket filled with products and then uh, you check out. That's an operational activity, right? Storing information about uh, Bart who checked out at the supermarket and bought his uh, pizza, frozen pizza and his beer. Okay, so let's look at the various types of business activities first. So in, in, within sales and marketing, we talk about order processing, we talk about pricing, and we talk about forecasting, right? So forecasting sales of your products, of your services, and so on, to anticipate inventory, to see that you don't have excess inventory or that you lack inventory and so on. Within production and logistics, we're gonna focus on process control to see that the manufacturing process, that there's no hiccups in the process. We're gonna look at planning, uh, sequence uh, ordering, for example, when we should finish what um, products in order to reduce slack capacity. I'm sure you, you, you've seen this or you will talk about it in courses like operations research where you use like linear programming kind of methods to come up with optimal schedules, production schedules and so on, or it could also be opening of a new production unit. In finance and accountancy, we have the registration of the financial uh, transactions. We have short-term budgeting, we have long-term planning. But in human resources, we have registration of recruitments and dismissal, right? Distribution of pay scales, we can look at planning of personnel needs and so on. These are just examples 
of a few types of business activities, obviously all of which need to be appropriately supported with um, accompanying IT technology. Remember the idea that I already voiced before, business IT alignment is really very important here. Here you can see this pyramid again, and here you can see that we added some activities here, like order processing, material movement, payroll, accounts payable, and so on. And here you can see the types of information systems. So here at the bottom, we have transaction processing systems, or TPS. Here at the middle management level, we have management information systems, or MIS, and decision support systems, or DSS. And here we have, at the strategic level, we have executive support systems. All of these should then support the business activities you see right here and right here. Again, taking care that both are well aligned business side CT alignments. I know um, I already mentioned it a few times, but I cannot stress it enough. The reason being that oftentimes uh, we work with a lot of firms in my group and oftentimes we still witness that business and IT are not well aligned when working with those firms. Let's look at operational information systems first. So um, let's give an example, right? And then um, um, an operational information system is an information system, for example, that is used to process um, sales when you check out in a supermarket, right? So uh, if I go to a supermarket, a Walmart or a Belgian type of supermarket, and I have a market basket and I fill it up with products and have to check out the information about my purchase needs to be stored. Uh, there should be a payment option included in that information system such that I can pay with a credit card or whatever kind of payment device. And um, all of that should be supported by an operational information system. This is a well-structured process. It's unambiguous and it's routinely uh, because supermarkets do this on a continuous basis, right? Decisions are short-term. They occur frequently. It's just a purchase decision. How much uh, the decision is here is how much uh, does Bart have to pay as he checks out what is frozen pizza and beer? Um, it occurs frequently because many customers check out. There's little uncertainties. The, the prices are known. Uh, the users are clerks, cashiers, sales assistants. The required information is easy to determine. It's independent of the individual. It's well structured and it comes from within the inner organization. Two types of examples of how this can be supported uh, IT-wise is by means of an online transaction processing system or an OLTP system or an enterprise resource planning ERP system. Here you can see an OLTP system, right? So we, we will come back to that later on. For the moment being, just try to remember the general purpose. Uh, OLTP system, so you have, uh, this is a payroll system to calculate how much um, uh, an, an employee should be paid. So you have all types of data elements that enter like the number, remember, an employee has a unique number, name, address, department, pay rate, vacation time, all of this, some certain types of withholdings, right? tax withholdings. All of this is stored in a payroll master file. It enters this OLTP system, right? And then all kinds of reports will come out, which we're gonna discuss later. And then you have employee number 46848. This is the name, this is the cross pay, et cetera. This is an OLTP system, so it can, uh, it can calculate this very frequently. An OLTP system, other examples, are, is a point of sale system like a supermarket, right? So this means that you check out in a supermarket, you have a system that will scan the products and that will calculate the price. That's a point of sale system and that will allow you to pay using a credit card, maybe using PayPal, maybe using whatever type of payment device, uh, payment method um, that you can think of. Or it could be an order entry system. You log on to Amazon, you fill up your shopping basket, or you do the same with Deliveroo. You fill up your shopping basket, the shopping basket, the value thereof, the, 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 the price thereof is calculated. So it's pretty straightforward. It's very structured information. We know the price of every product. Uh, there's, there's no uncertainty in an uh, OLTP system or in an operational system, as I said before. Financial transaction system um, is another type of OLTP system. To, allows you to make credit card payments, one example being PayPal, as I already mentioned. An enterprise resource planning system or an ERP system can also be used to support those operational activities. It's a single information system. It works company-wide, so it's not like sales and marketing have their own system and production and logistics have their own system and HR has their own system. No, an ERP system works firm-wide, so it's one system that will support 
sales and marketing that will support production and logistics, that will support HR, that will support finance and accounting and so on. And it integrates business processes firm-wide. So integration is really a key element as we talk about enterprise resource planning systems. They're often off the shelf modules. So off the shelf means that you just pick them off the shelf. So they're readily configured. It's not like you have to pick several products and combine them. You pick one product off the shelf and it's based on best practices within particular types of industries, right? A plain vanilla ERP system should be contrasted with a customized system. A customized system is an information system um, which is heavily customized towards particular types of business units, towards, towards um, uh, sales and marketing, towards production, um, manufacturing, towards HR, finance and accounting, and so on. So plain vanilla system uh, means that uh, you have a system that works firm white and is heavily standardized. That's really very important in ERP is that the system is heavily standardized. And there's very well-known vendors in the area like SAP is the, probably one of the market leaders uh, like at university, we have SAP to support all our university activities. Uh, but SAP also has could could be used by other firms. It's also heavily used in a banking setting and so on, right? So Oracle and PeopleSoft. Oracle is a firm. PeopleSoft, the product, is another type of um, well-known ERP system together with Odo and Open ERP. You can see how an ERP system works. So it has a centralized database. So all information about the company is stored in the centralized database. And then various information feeds in, right? Various information feeds in from human resources, from finance and accounting, from sales and marketing, from manufacturing information. And the information is being fed in is then going to be extracted um, to, for reporting purposes for all types of business activities. Okay, let's step up one level in that permit and let's have a look at tactical information systems. So here the processes tend to be somewhat less routinely, not daily, not highly structured. So the decisions are gonna be more midterm, like between one and five years, I would say. Don't uh, quote me on that time period, but just to give you an indication, it's between one and five years. Decisions will occur somewhat less often. There's more uncertainties and risks the users are the middle management. The required information is extracted from the operational level below and from a data warehouse. We're going to talk about data warehouses later on in this course, but you can, for the moment being, you can uh, think of a data warehouse as a central huge data platform that stores all historical information of the firm. So the required information is somewhat less easier to determine it will be dependent upon the individual and the moment when the decision has to be made, depending upon the environment, whether we're in a crisis, yes or not, like a pandemic. The information will be somewhat less structured and the need for external information will increase. Two popular examples of tactical information systems are management information systems, abbreviated as MIS, and decision support systems, abbreviated as DSS. Let's elaborate a bit further. Components of a management information systems are input, which are transaction records, or input that you get from that centralized data storage platform, from that data warehouse. The process will be routine reporting, and it's still low level analysis, right? So it's in between the operational level and the strategic level, remember? And the output will then be summary reports, exception reports, and the users will be middle managers. So middle managers, are just below the C-level executives. C-level executives, we all know that term, so I'm referring to the chief executive officer, the chief information officer, chief financial officer, etc. You can see an example of a management information system. Uh, to the left, we have all kinds of information or data that feeds into it, like an order file, production master file, accounting files. These are then fed into the transaction processing systems at the lowest level. And these then feed further into the management information systems to generate uh, data at an aggregated level about sales, about unit product cost, about product change data and expense data. And from there onwards, various reports can be generated by the MIS, which are then given to the managers to make their midterm decisions, right? So between one to five years decisions. Here you can see some of the reports, right? So you can see it's more at an aggregated level. You can look at sales by 
geography. Um, you can look at sales by time period. You can look at sales by geography and time period and so on. Uh, that will allow you to get insight into what are your most popular products, what are your least popular products, um, etc. The decision support system is also situated at that um, middle level. And I have to be honest, right? So uh, the, the distinction between a management information system and the decision support system is not always clear cut, right? But a management, the decision support system is also at the management level and it will make use of data analysis for decision making. The input data is low volume. It again comes from the data warehouse. We will use analytical models and data analysis tools already to help us make certain types of decisions, but it will also facilitate interactive processing of the data and allow us to do simulations like what if analysis, right? What if analysis are very important components of decision support systems. The output will be more special reports. Uh, it, the output could also be decisions which are suggested or answers to specific types of queries. Users are middle and executive managers. Let's give an example. Credit scoring, which happens to be one of my core fields of expertise. I did my PhD on credit scoring, so it's one of my the, the things that I like talking about. So let's look at a bank. What would, at an operational level, a bank is going to process transactions. So at an operational level, a bank allows you to put money on your account, uh, to do a wire transfer, to do a payment with your bank account, to do a payment with your credit card. This is the operational level. A decision support system is more at the tactical level. Uh, it could be deciding to accept a credit for a customer, yes or not. So let's suppose that I go to a bank and ask for a mortgage because I'm interested in purchasing a house. Then the bank will gather all kinds of information about me, my customer characteristics, the loan characteristic. It will also look at the state of the macro economy, etc. These are um, decisions that will be made by a decision support system. The decision support system will help you to decide whether credit should be accepted, yes or no, right? So this is at the tactical level. A recommendation uh, system, which are the type of systems uh, which are being adopted by Amazon and Netflix to, to decide what books or uh, movies should be recommended to you, is also an example of a decision support system. It will make its recommendations based upon previously seen movies, previously bought products, based on the reviews that you've given to the to the bank, to the to Netflix or Amazon, based on a time of the year, for example, if you're around the Christmas period, you may be more uh, interested in Christmas movies and so on. Um, this, this is an example of a recommendation decision support system. One step above are strategic information systems, and those aim at answering strategic uh, decisions like, should we do a merger and acquisition? Should we, um, for example, examples of strategic decisions could be, should we do an acquisition of a firm? Or should we outsource all our IT uh, activities to India? That's a strategic decision. That's not a decision that you make overnight. If you think about outsourcing your IT, or if you think about acquiring another firm, you're going to carefully think about that. There's lots of uncertainty, so you can see that the level of uncertainty is a lot bigger than just at the lowest operational level, where you're just looking at product prices. Here you're looking at no longer product prices, but at the value of the company that you're about to acquire and how much you're willing to pay for it, which is a lot more difficult and has a lot more uncertainty connected to it. So the processes are more unstructured, less unambiguous, um, um, it, it happens occasionally or you're not acquiring firms on a daily basis, at least not a, that I think of. The decisions are more the long term. It's rather incidental, irregular, uh, much uncertainty. The users are the C-level executives, like the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, the chief information officer, etc. And the required information is very hard to determine because it's very hard to value the firm that you're about to acquire. It's very hard to see whether you're going to outsource your IT uh, department to India. What's the difference between keeping it in-house versus outsourcing it? So the value calculations and comparisons that you have to make are not that straightforward. It will also be strongly dependent on the decision maker. It's less structured and it, compares, it occurs in the company's environment. 
There we're going to have make use of executive support systems, things like data warehousing, OLAP, analytics, often referred to as data mining, web mining, etc. Executive support systems also have various components. So here the communication and ca calculations are at the strategic level. The input is external and internal aggregated data. So the input is external because if you're about to acquire a firm, you need to look at the firm's uh, balance sheet. You need to look at the firm's financial statement. You need to, uh, to look at how the firm is positioned in the market, where the firm is positioned in the value chain, etc. So the input gets very external. The processing is tends to be more graphical, more simulations, more interactive. What happens if we acquire firm A? How smoothly will it integrate with our existing business models? What are new business opportunities that will arise? So you will simulate all of that. You will make project projections. You will try to give answers to particular types of queries. The users are the C-level executives, right? So the board of directors and or the top level managers. Here you can see some how this all works together. So you have internal data, external data at the center. Uh, the internal data can then also stem now from the transaction processing systems, from the MIS systems, even from the decision support systems. You have external data, um, data from external firms, but also stock price data, internet data, uh, ratings data, right? Standard & Poor's, for example, is an agency that performs credit ratings, that assigns credit ratings to companies worldwide. So if you're about to acquire a particular type of company, you want to see how credit worthy that company is, and you may want to rely on Standard & Poor's. Note that Standard & Poor's is just one type of company that is doing this, and other ones are like Moody's and, and, and Fitch. All of this information can then feed into various types of executive support systems to help you uh, do all those simulations, those what-if scenarios, uh, to help you decide whether to acquire a firm or whether to outsource your um, IT department, yes or no. Here you can see an executive support system being visualized with a sales dashboard. Um, really important there is that the system uh, allows you to do uh, simulations, what-if analysis, scenario analysis, etc. Here you can see how the loop and all the systems connect to one another. So they're, ha they're highly interconnected. So we have the transaction processing systems, which are going to feed into the management information systems and the decision support systems that also mutually interact, both of which then also feed into the top level strategic information system or executive support system. Last slide. Um, note that beside these types of systems, this is not an exhaustive list, list of information systems, but we also have other types of information systems like office automation systems. Think about Microsoft Office. It provides office automation, text processing, Microsoft Word, voicemail, email, Microsoft Outlook, video conferencing, Skype, scheduling systems, etc. Um, these are other, one other type of information system. And yet another one is a very specific one. It's a knowledge work system, KWS, which are very specialized systems for scientists, engineers, even financial anal analysts and other types of knowledge workers to obtain new types of knowledge uh, that will help contribute to the creation and improvement of, uh, of products. Here we're talking about computer-aided design, virtual reality systems, stability calculations, etc. So we hereby conclude the first part of this uh, chapter um, in which we talked about we, we talked about data information and knowledge, we talked about systems, we talked about business information systems and various types of business information systems.